Uh, guten Morgen. Uh, this is the third and will probably be as far as the Tsarist era uh, before the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 during Middle World War I, uh, the final uh, section on the history of Russian Germans. And I'll probably take a little break after that as far as the series is concerned. Uh, I'm trying mainly here to provide kind of a, a background for people of Russian-German heritage living in North America, the United States and Canada. But of course, uh, there are also diaspora groups in other places uh, in both the Western Hemisphere and in the Eastern Hemisphere, obviously. Uh, the whole group being uh, diasporas of diasporas. Uh, but obviously, since the presentation is English language, uh, the United States and Canada are the primary focus. Now, obviously, I more than welcome anybody in Argentina who is fluent in English to watch this. Uh, but obviously, since Spanish is the major language in Argentina, on other uh, destinations, uh, for the Russian-German diaspora in uh, the New World, Paraguay. Uh, some even went to uh, Mexico, uh, Mennonites who went via Canada. Uh, uh, Portuguese for those who went to Brazil. And then obviously uh, there's also the whole issue of the diasporas uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, both those that are in former Soviet states such as Kazakhstan, uh, and those who have returned to Germany. So now we have this complex situation of people leaving Germany to go to the Russian Empire and then leaving uh, the Soviet Union or the former Soviet states to go back to Germany, but having uh, been separated for, from the mainstream German history and culture for some time, uh, still have distinct cultural differences. So with that, uh, I'm going to focus mainly on here finishing up the 19th century and hopefully the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, most of the um, Americans and Canadians uh, that have Russian-German heritage, their ancestors uh, came to the United States or Canada in the late 19th century after uh, the beginning of the revocation of privileges, 1871, right to self-government, 1874, uh, right to freedom from conscription, very, very important. Uh, many uh, coming to the U.S. during the Russo-Japanese War, they had been conscripted, served in the military, and then were being mobilized to fight against the Japanese, the case of my own great-grandfather. Uh, and then... Uh, there's a great drop-off uh, of migration uh, to the United States uh, in general in the later period, the 1920s. Uh, we're not letting anybody in, uh, regardless of uh, ethnicity. Uh, and, of course, uh, the borders of the Soviet Union then get sealed until World War II. Uh, and then... Uh, there's a brief period of time when people can escape westward, but for the most of the Soviet period, emigration is basically uh, extremely limited. It's in fact from the 19 uh, for most of the uh, most of the time it, it, it's explicitly banned. But there is a limited amount of emigration, particularly for ethnic Germans, allowed during the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, but it is it is restricted. But during the 1950s, um, well, there's a little bit in the 1950s, but for the most part, uh, if you look at uh, the population in the United States that uh, has a heritage of Volga German or Black Sea German, or in my own case, Bohinian German, uh, their ancestors came between the period of 1871 with the revocation of uh, the right to communal self-government uh, and the start of World War One in 1914. So this is a period of time between uh, the late 19th and early 20th century. So 
Uh, the migration into the Russian Empire itself from what is now Germany uh, continues. Uh, we went over the mass migration of about 100,000 people, uh, particularly from Baden-Württemberg, which is in the southwest of Germany today. Also from uh, Alsace, part of Alsace-Lorraine province in France, but is a German culturally and language-wise. Uh, it's now currently part of France, was part of France up until 1871, and then was taken by uh, the Germans in the Franco-Prussian War, and then reattached uh, to France after World War I. Uh, the Germans take it again during World War II, and then it gets reattached to France. Uh, but a number of the Black Sea Germans are ethnic Germans from uh, Alsace-Lorraine, and uh, As, uh, as far as cuisine is concerned, um, uh, many of my favorite dishes, although I've never been to Alsace itself, uh, with that, when I could eat them uh, are Alsatian in origin. For some reason, if you just combine the, the yummy, yummy German pork sausage with the, and other pork cutlets with a, a French way of, of cooking it, it's very delicious. Uh, so. In addition to that migration, which comes after the initial migration in the late 18th century, starting in 1764, after the 1763 Manifesto by Catherine II, of some 22,000 ethnic Germans, uh, the largest number coming from Hesse and of central northwest Germany today, into the Volga region, uh, we have some other uh, migrations. Uh, see here. In 1813, oh, uh, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, we start to see uh, migration into Bessarabia. Now Bessarabia is taken by the Russian Empire uh, from Moldova. And Moldova is one of two principalities that was under Ottoman uh, vassalage. And the other one is uh, Wallachia to the south. And along with uh, Transylvania uh, made up the modern Romanian state after World War I. But the initial uh, creation of Romania uh, comes from merging uh, Moldova and Wallachia. Uh, and Moldova loses the, the territory, it's now called Moldova itself, uh, of Bessarabia uh, to the Russian Empire during the end of the Napoleonic Wars. And after 1813, uh, there's a fair amount of German immigration into the territory. Although the, they, unlike the Germans in the Volga region or Ukraine, uh, never come under communist rule. Uh, the uh, Bessarabia becomes part of Greater Romania after World War I rather than becoming part of uh, the Soviet Union. And it remains uh, part of Romania until 1940 when it's annexed by the Soviet Union. But uh, almost all of the Germans are allowed to be evacuated with a big giant trek uh, because the uh, Partition of the territory, giving a Bessarabia to, from Romania to the Soviet Union, is part of an agreement between Nazi Germany uh, and the Soviet Union, the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 23rd August 1939. Uh, so a, a lot of Americans and Canadians of Bessarabian German descent, uh, uh, and as you see, they got there fairly late, and they're not there very long, from 1813 to 1940. Uh, but again, most of the Americans of Bessarabian descent uh, coming earlier uh, to uh, the Americas, uh, the United States, Canada, uh, then World War II. Okay, the next, uh, 1817, uh, there is a migration to the Caucasus, uh, Georgia, uh, later Azerbaijan. And by the end of World War, uh, by the big start of World War II, uh, fairly large communities uh, in these two republics. Uh, 
but uh, that's kind of the 1817 uh, migration directly uh, from the Caucasus to the Caucasus from uh, Germany. And then the final uh, migration, this is uh, really the three main migrations of ethnic Germans into Russia uh, as far as the largest numbers coming in and importance. Uh, Bessarabia could be a fourth depending on how you want to consider it. Uh, since I'm an a expert on Soviet history rather than Tsarist Russian history, Bessarabia is kind of not my attention as far as ethnic Germans are concerned because the, they miss out on uh, the entire Soviet period. So, uh, But they are considered part of the Russian German uh, historically as far as the Tsarist area is concerned. But the, the, the Volga region in the late 18th century and then in the early and mid 19th century uh, German migration to the Black Sea region and southern Ukraine uh, and Crimea and then the final group is into uh, Volhynia, which is uh, northwestern Ukraine. Uh, and this occurs uh, as a result of Polish uprisings. Uh, there's two of them. Uh, but after the first one, beginning in 1831, they start to, uh, Russian government confiscates a number of Polish estates and sells them off to Germans who want to migrate to the area, uh, both from Prussia, uh, in uh, what is now northern Germany, uh, well, what, no, I'm sorry, what is now northern Poland, the map changes, uh, what is now northern Poland, uh, but what's part of Prussia, and uh, what was called Congress Poland, which is the center of Poland itself today. Uh, a number of immigrants from Uh, that were ethnically German that had come first to Congress Poland and later went to the Russian Empire proper, Volhynia. Now the way this worked was uh, Poland had been an independent kingdom, uh, had actually been uh, a commonwealth, a dual kingdom with uh, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. And then in the late 18th century, uh, starting again under Catherine the Great, uh, it becomes partitioned. Uh, it becomes partitioned a total of three times and disappears uh, between Prussia, Austria, and the Russian Empire. Now, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, Napoleon resurrects uh, a Polish uh, state that is allied with France briefly. And after uh, the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, uh, the Congress of Vienna reassigns this area of Poland, the area that had been uh, annexed uh, before uh, the Napoleonic Wars, back to Russia. But uh, it and Finland, which is taken away from Sweden and given to Russia, are technically uh, independent. Uh, the Grand uh, Duchy of Finland uh, and the Kingdom of Poland. Well, the thing is, the king of Poland is the Tsar of Russia. Tsar Alexander I is also the king of Poland. So, since the absolute monarch rules everything, even though technically it's a separate kingdom, uh, it's within the Russian Empire rather than uh, a constitutional or integral part of the Russian Empire. And, of course, this changes after the uprisings in uh, 1830 and then again in 18. 63, which we're talking about here, uh, it was for all intents and purposes ruled by uh, the Tsar. Uh, but uh, there were a number already of Germans uh, who had immigrated here uh, from particularly Prussia and some places even further afield. Uh, my, my own family, they went to Volhynia from uh, Congress Poland as well. They were in Woj for a while before uh, going to Zhitomir Oblast. Uh, so the Polish uprising, of course, Poland extended far east and south into what is today Ukraine uh, and what becomes annexed uh, as part of the Russian Empire outside of Congress Poland. Uh, and these Polish landlords, after the uprising, uh, lose a lot of their land and the 
the land is then uh, made available for long-term lease mostly uh, to German settlers coming in from both outside the Russian Empire, but also many, uh, over 400,000 at the time, uh, Germans living in Congress, Poland. Uh, so they come there, and, and a lot of the land is divided in the way they have the, the place where they live is separate from the place they farm. The farm is called a hutor. Uh, but this is actually, in terms of numbers, people coming in to the Russian Empire proper, and again, a number are coming in from uh, Poland, Congress Poland already under Russian rule, the largest wave of German immigrants into the Russian, Russia proper, uh, in, Russia meaning Russia, uh, the political entity. So I'm including Ukraine here, though obviously I know that Ukrainians are ethnically uh, completely non-Russian, uh, and certainly the way they uh, viewed themselves uh, historically. But the Russian Empire outside of, of the special administrative uh, caveats of Finland and Poland, right? So Finland and Poland have kind of a special legal status, uh, at least on paper, uh, after the Napoleonic Wars uh, in 1815. Uh, so 170,000 uh, ethnic Germans come into Volhynia in the northwest of Ukraine between uh, 1831 and 1880. This is the largest number. But again, one of the reasons why uh, they're not emphasized as much, I think, historically, as uh, either the Volga Germans or the Black Sea Germans, uh, as these people basically miss out on Sovietization. And the reason they do it different uh, somewhat from the Bessarabians, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but uh, they experienced in World War I what the rest of the German population and European areas of the Soviet Union experienced in World War II. That is, they are uh, forcibly uh, deported eastward into the interior of the Soviet Union, uh, and the communities are dispersed uh, and broken up. Uh, while some managed to return uh, in the Soviet period, uh, many of them don't. Uh, many of them remain uh, outside the region. But uh, we'll get to that. But uh, so what we have here is uh, the German communities now uh, under various different legal documents and various different geographical areas, uh, various different religions. Uh, the three main ones being Lutheran, Roman Catholic, uh, and then Mennonite. Uh, there's a huge amount of diversity, and basically. What defines all these groups is German, as I said, they speak uh, a dialect of uh, German. Uh, again, this is a, a issue of diversity within Germany itself. They are not Orthodox Christians. They are Western Christians, either Roman Catholic or one of the Protestant traditions, uh, mostly uh, the Lutheran, uh, some uh, of them uh, Anabaptists, the Mennonites. Uh, they can chase their uh, descent to people who immigrated from Central Europe. There is no German state till 1871. This is important. We'll get to it. Uh, and as we see, some are coming from uh, places that never became uh, part of what is Germany today. Uh, and others coming from uh, what was part of Germany before World War II, but obviously not now as a result of the border changes and ethnic cleansing at the end of the Second World War to de-Germanize uh, the eastern areas uh, that had been the core of the German state in Prussia. And they, uh, uh, when we get to the Soviet period, we'll talk about how this kind of coalesces, but uh, to why all these people end up uh, coming under the rubric of Russian Germans, for, for a long time for the population itself, uh, this is not how they mainly consider themselves. Uh, it, it really in the 20th century with Soviet persecution for being ethnic German that this is a result of. Uh, before that, they would think of themselves along their local villages. Uh, they would describe themselves uh, on confessional grounds, the Lutheran, the Catholic, the Mennonite. 
1871, things change radically. And again, what is happening in Central Europe is key to what happens in the Russian Empire in this regard. We looked at the first, the Seven Year War for the settlement of the Volga, and then we looked at the Napoleonic Wars for settlement of the Black Sea region. And so what happened in 1871, the Franco-Prussian War, there's now a unified German state, uh, and the Russian government is afraid that the German colonies within the Russian Empire could become islands, Trojan horses, loyal to the German state. Uh, and so it seeks to uh, standardize uh, their legal status with that of the freed serfs. It seeks to remove their privileges uh, to remove uh, their ability to act as a separate uh, legal uh, islands uh, that might have some sort of political loyalty uh, to people whom they are related to ethnically and culturally in Central Europe in the new unified uh, Second Reich that has been established as a result of the defeat of France. So they take away the right to communal self-government in 1871. They take away the right of freedom from conscription in 1874. Uh, there is the problem I've gone over of uh, land shortages uh, increasingly, uh, more pronounced in the Black Sea region where they have uh, tenure where the youngest son inherits all of the land and they have to find land to uh, purchase for the older son. In the Volga region, of course, there's uh, the communal repatriation, uh, reassignment of land periodically, uh, means basically uh, that this is not as acute. It can kind of kind of be delayed a little bit. But what you end up is you have the same amount of land total and the growing population. Ultimately, the per capita available land is getting smaller and smaller. Uh, and there's also the problem uh, that this is not the most efficient. Uh, way of doing agriculture. And there is, uh, in the Tsarist period, one major famine, 1891 to 1892, in the Volga region, uh, which does spark emigration. So uh, much of this migration is eastward when they open up Siberia and Kazakhstan, uh, but much of it is westward. As I said, for Americans and Canadians and even people in Argentina, uh, a lot of people uh, who are German ancestry, descent, uh, uh, did not arrive, if we look at their family trees, in the United States or Canada directly from Germany. Their ancestors left Central Europe before 1871, before there was a German state, uh, went to the Russian Empire, went to the Volga region, uh, went to the Ukraine, uh, went to Crimea went to uh, even some to uh, Georgia. Uh, but for the most part, uh, for the ancestry of American of German descent, we're looking at those who went to uh, the Volga region, the Black Sea region, uh, Bessarabia, uh, and uh, Volhynia. So uh, the two large groups would be the Volga region, which is just northwest of uh, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Now, the emigration is quite large after 1871. Uh, and to give an example here, uh, during 1870, 1880, some 15,000 uh, ethnic Germans emigrate from the Russian Empire to the United States. Uh, by 1900, uh, the number is up to 50,000. And then the big, huge wave of 1900 to 1915, the number goes up to over 137,000 uh, Russian Germans in the U.S. Uh, today, there's probably over a million, maybe uh, much more, depending on how you define it, of people that are uh, ethnic, that have the ancestry of Russian Germans uh, in the U.S. that are aware of it, uh, at least. Uh, maybe much more people who have uh, forgotten a uh, tiny portion, obviously. There's a lot of mixture with uh, other European groups, especially other uh, German groups uh, in the U.S. But certain areas, uh, for the Black Sea Germans, uh, particularly North Dakota, uh, for the Volga Germans, uh, Kansas and Nebraska, 
uh, very large percentage uh, of the European descended population uh, are Russian Germans. So that uh, wraps us up. And this is think, these things keep getting longer and longer because I keep getting more explanations. But this will be about 25 minutes, uh, and this kind of wraps up the migration into the U.S. Uh, up until uh, World War One, starting in 1914. Uh, so uh, the next one will start with World War One because that's really the origins. Well, not the origins. The really the immediate origins, the catalysts, as you will, of the Bolshevik Revolution and Sovietization. But I wanted to get through uh, this uh, migration uh, to the Western Hemisphere, uh, U.S., Canada, Argentina, the three major ones at this time. Uh, again, problems of, of land shortages, problems of loss of privileges, particularly military conscription and uh, subsequent mobilization of reserves, again, the Russo-Japanese War, and the huge number of Russian-German men who are avoiding mobilization uh, into the U.S. and Canada. All right, so uh, we'll leave it at that. Uh, so the next uh, one I do on Russian-Germans, which will probably not be the next video I do, uh, will be uh, on World War I. Uh, and the early uh, Soviet period after the Bolshevik Revolution uh, in 1917. So, auf Wiedersehen.